Hello and welcome to the Physique Development Podcast. This is episode 33. This is a podcast bringing you structured Q&As, deep dives on single topics, and inside looks at our team. In today's episode, we're talking about first-time competitor stuff. Um, so if you are a first-time competitor, this is going to be a great one for you, and we're going to introduce a lot of, a lot of topics that are going to be helpful to know before we compete, um, and then we'll kind of expand from there. So I'm going to hand it over to Sue, and we'll get right into today's episode. Thank you, Austin. So within this episode, we're going to probably end up doing two parts or multiple parts to this because this is basically going to be some of our thoughts and advice as a first time competitor, which we think is very extremely important for you guys to take after years of competing ourselves, all three of us years of competing as well as um, coaching and having that under our belt and knowing what that is like from a competitor perspective. So we're going to get into a lot of our advice and some things we think you should know. And then in part two slash part three, we'll be getting into some specific questions about prep. So as always, we will have our uh, question um, below in the show notes that you can submit a question to us. So if you have one that's prep specific, then definitely feel free to submit it so we can get to that in the second part of the podcast. So we'll go ahead and get started and talk about before getting into prep. So Alex, what would you say are some top things that you would recommend or just one thing that you would recommend before getting into a prep that someone should do? Sure. Uh, the, the first thing that I would say is that this is going to be, um, it, it's challenging because it is a new hobby as an adult. When you are doing physical activity as a, a kiddo or uh, as you get into high school and those different factors, the, the people that you're going to be competing against or that you see in your sphere are going to be in relative ability of you if you've been, you know, uh, practicing that sport for the same duration of time or what have you. Whereas within bodybuilding, this is something that many people pick up into their adulthood. So it's very challenging that that reference point that you've experienced in previous athletic engagements um, is no longer the the rule of thumb. And so it becomes a very challenging component there. Uh, and understanding that you're a novice, and this is chapter one of this new venture for you. So it, it, you're not going to be the, the best at this right away. You're going to, to run into uh, bumps in the road and, and have uh, things that you could have done differently in hindsight. And that's okay. This is a, a process of, of learning about a new sport, learning about a new endeavor for yourself. Um, so starting there and having that base of understanding that errors are going to be made is a big piece of the puzzle. And then uh, once you decide that you're wanting to compete or, or interested in competing, now is the time to, to spend some time within education. Uh, submerge yourself within uh, different sh like local shows. Try to find local shows within different federations and those different factors. There's going to be many different federations within um, natural federations as well as the, the NPC is going to be your most common. And so you're going to be able to find shows. All you have to do is, is type in NPC and then your state. And oftentimes it's going to lead you to a good place with a base of maybe three to five shows that are going to be happening within your city or within your state more so. Um, and then obviously dates and, and going to attend them. Um, and then within that also understanding the different divisions within the, um, that you could be competing within. So for, for women, it's going to be bikini. It's going to be wellness. It's going to be figure. It's going to be women's bodybuilding. And then men are going to have men's physique. They're going to have classic physique. They're going to have uh, men's open bodybuilding as well. So that's kind of your, your base understanding. If you're competing in the MPC um, and you have, you know, the WMBF and, and those different factors that are going to be uh, different divisions or, or different competitions as a whole. Yeah. And within attending shows, a big reason that we recommend attending a show is because like Alex said, it's a brand new hobby and you don't know, you really cannot get a clue of how shows run just from social media, of just seeing someone's show day vlog, of just seeing someone post about it on their story and talk about what to expect in show day. You really cannot know unless you go to a show and experience it. And when coaches or other competitors say it's a hurry up and wait game, um, very much so is that and you experience that when you do go to your first show of kind of what that looks like for experiencing, okay, how fast are they through the divisions? How do they call people out? What are these things that they're saying as they're going through it? I mean, imagine if you were to pick up soccer and never watch a soccer game 
before deciding to go play in a soccer game. That would be pretty difficult to navigate through, um, especially like Alex said, picking it up as an adult or more so as an adult than you have in the past. So it's great to experience it, to kind of see and to study the sport more. What we really push forward, especially if someone is a first time competitor and wanting to be a competitor for the long haul, um, which we really enjoy working with competitors who want to continue to succeed, who want to continue to improve. Um, instead of just checking it off their bucket list. But it is something that you need to know how to study the sport, how to watch someone's posing, how to be able to see how someone fits into a division. And so the more that you can go to shows and kind of figure that out, and not to say that you need to be an expert by your first show, but attending at least one show will be very helpful for you to understand what show day is going to be like, as well as to immerse yourself in the sport a little bit more to see how things are being judged to understand the flow of things. Yeah, I remember my first show, I did not ever attend a show. And I was clueless. I mean, I, I remember, I, I think I've told this story before, but I'll quickly tell it. Like, I remember I was there sitting there with my, next to my mom at my first show uh, that I had prepped for, kind of gotten talked into doing. And then my mom turns to me and asks, like, do you have to do a routine? And I was like, I think so. She's like, do you have a routine? And I was like, no. And so basically in a matter of like the pros going on stage first, has, that's how it usually happens. If it, there's a pro show there too, alongside the amateur show, I basically just watched the pros kind of emulated what they were doing. Uh, I did that for about an hour and then like backstage, I got backstage. It was just like, I kind of, I was just sitting there by myself, kind of ask people like, Hey, are we supposed to warm up now? Like, should we, are we supposed to pump up? And people, you know, I'm like one of the only ones with my clothes still on. And like, I mean, it was just the funniest experience um, that I was like super nervous about. Um, and, and that a lot of that could have been taken away if I had just attended a show before I ever did a show. I mean, that's, it seems like a clear thing, but it's just, it, please do that if you can, because it just clears so many things up that you may have questions on. Yes. Even for myself, I had zero clue. I just watched a lot of people's videos on YouTube. And that did help me take a step further than where Austin was at. But it was something that I was still very much so like, what do I do back here? When do I do this? Um, and also, if your coach isn't responsive in that moment, then you're like, well, I really, really don't know what to do. Um, so it's definitely helpful to go ahead and attend those shows um, and to learn about the divisions, to learn about the sport and to be there to spectate it. So um, some other things that we wanted to go over as far as before getting into prep um, is talking about coaches. So uh, when you're looking for a coach, it is very helpful to uh, try and be thoughtful about that decision. Instead of just being like, I want to compete the first coach that I see that says they coach competitors, I'm going to talk to or I say I want to compete and my friend says, well, my coach coaches competitors, I'm just going to go ahead with them. Um, I think it's extremely important to take some time to consume that coach's content on social media, YouTube, podcasts, wherever it may be, to truly see about their coaching philosophies to see if you're going to mesh well, um, if you guys have the same thought process for how that prep is going to be accomplished um, and being able to just see what they're capable of and then being able to get on calls and really have those discussions one-on-one -on -one within those coaches. Yeah, I, I think that within seeking a coach, Austin talked about how he was talked into his first competition. <laughs> and th this happens to a lot of people. He is not alone in this. I would say it's more common than not, where within the first competition, oftentimes someone will have a local, uh, a personal trainer at their gym see them training and see the kind of shape that they're in um, and and speak up to them of like, hey, you could do well in X, Y, and Z division. You should compete and I can coach you for free or for very cheap or, or something along those lines. And then they receive this uh, cookie cutter meal plan and then kind of just are, are driving home cardio and it's not the best experience as a whole. And unfortunately, I'm sure that some of you that are listening are either laughing or shaking your head because it's like, yep, that was 100% my first show as well. And so if you go with the approach of, of 
taking in the content and, and listening to podcasts and, and listening or uh, utilizing their Instagram and, and talking to their current or previous clients of the coach that you are uh, desiring to work with is going to be big. Um, one thing that I will say as you have the opportunity to speak to these coaches or, or ourselves or whomever collect questions that you have within the the podcast, within the Instagram posts, whatever you are consuming their content from, collect questions from that. And then also have a list of things that are uh, kind of like steadfast for you of this is very important to me. I'm not willing to budge on these things and make sure that that is conveyed to the coach and that they are understanding of um, those uh things that you find so important so that you're on the same page. If you come with questions, if you come with a, a better understanding, one, the coach is going to be, a, at least from from our point of view, very uh, appreciative and understanding that you're very serious about what you're wanting to embark upon. Um, because I know that for myself, when I get on calls with first-time competitors, that they're just like, I don't know. I saw an Instagram post and like, she looked awesome. So I wanted to look like her. I don't really know how to track my food, but like, I want to look like her. So let's do a contest prep. And it's like, that's not this. Um, and, and the, the big thing there is just coming with greater intent as well as competing is always going to be there. And we'll talk about that. I'm sure throughout this entire process, but as you are finding a coach, it's going to be better for you to find a very high quality coach to work with rather than just rushing in because you want to compete so badly and have that kind of instant gratification for something that you are stimulated by within social media. And so if you take your time and you find a coach that aligns with you well, there's a lot of benefits to this where your health is going to be of greater priority. You're probably going to compete 10 X better than what you would have without them. Um, and you're going to have a, a better appreciation for what the sport brings. Cause there's a lot of things outside of the, the competition itself that benefit you from just a life perspective within your discipline, within your organization. Uh, I think mental toughness is a big piece of the puzzle too. And so there's a lot of things that benefit your outside life within competing that you can benefit from if you know you have the, the right leadership in place. Yeah. And within that, it's not to say that if you're a first time competitor, you want to be a competitor and you do think the way that Alex just said of, oh, I want to look like that person X, Y, and Z realize that if you are going to a coach and they tell you, Hey, you're not ready, or you need this time, or I think that it would be more beneficial if we take a year really just to hammer down things to not take that as, Oh, I'm just going to go to the coach that's going to do it for me, but to really take inventory of what they're saying to you and why they're saying that because I'm going to tell you that as a coach, if they say those kind of things, then they actually care versus it being a money grab. Like no coach is saying that to grab your money because they know that it normally doesn't work that way. Um, you know that if you tell someone to wait, they're probably going to go on to someone else. Um, so it is something where the more that you can be respectful of the process and open to that, even if you don't know as much as maybe someone would like you to know, whatever it may be of saying, hey, this is something I do want to accomplish. What are the steps to get there? And I'm willing to take your expertise because I am hiring you to take these steps in the right direction. Um, because what we see with first time competitors that really don't have that kind of attitude is that they end up just kind of thinking, oh, I'm just going to look like this. And then prep can really rock them um, or post prep can really rock them. So being able to kind of be open to those conversations is going to be very helpful as a first time competitor as well. Yeah. And one thing I'll add to that too is like, kind of compounding on those those uh responses there is like these are exactly these are the exact reasons why your local trainer the, the person may be talking you into this they may be the right fit for you but they're probably not and if they are, are kind of like trying to get you into this um and trying to talk you into this and they're the ones introducing you to this idea for the first time and are trying to get you right into a prep and like hey there's this show three weeks you know three months from now, yeah. you may, that's a red flag, right? Like that's, and it's not a red flag on that person. It's just a red flag on that experience, uh, that perspective experience, because it, it's just, it's not probably going to turn out how you liked it to. Um, there are outliers to this. I'm fortunately an outlier to this where I got very lucky in my first show. And I kind of, there was definite experiences that I would turn back time and try to like maybe change as far as like how I went about my first prep based off of my local trainer who gave me some advice. Um, thankfully he came from a 
successful natural bodybuilding world. But like, even then it was like, all right, knowing what I know now, knowing what we know now, it's like, all right, I'm not going to do that ever again. Um, and there were definitely things that I was misled on, misguided on. And there were, you know, as we're going to talk about here, um, throughout this episode and, and following ones is prep extends beyond what you're doing in the gym prep extends beyond what you're going to display potentially on a stage. Right. So, um, having these conversations with perspective coaches, digesting content, knowing what you're getting into, right. This isn't just, I bought it. This isn't just a hobby where it's like, okay, I bought a guitar. I kind of pick it up and plumb the strings every once in a while. I open the app to, to learn the guitar every few weeks. And that guitar is just going to sit there. You know, it's not like you have a guitar recital coming up. And if you, <laughs> you know, if you're doing that and learning guitar, kudos to you, I guess. But, um, you know, that, that's about how it's going to go, right? Like if you are entering this idea of like, okay, I'm going to kind of dabble in this and then ha have a show at the end. I mean, in, in terms of like an adult embarrassment is like a real thing, right? And it, probably one of the biggest things that keep us from doing things as an adult that we have such a pleasure of when we're children, right? Is like ignorance is bliss in that. And you go in, you're like sort of, sort of shameless. You're just like, whatever, I'm here to play, you know, I'm here to have fun. And that's a great mentality. But when it comes to contest prep, this is a great hobby that can teach you a ton about yourself and, and get you into great shape. But damn, it is not the same thing. So, um, you know, I, I just wanted to stress that and, and kind of like compound the reason of that local person, that person that may be talking you into this, you know, they could be the catalyst to get you in it, but that doesn't mean necessarily they're the right person for you to get you there. So I just wanted to kind of get that out of my head. <laughs> yeah. And I think that is great because it also segues into talking about just being able to already have a foundation within training and tracking, because within what Austin is saying of being thrown into something or taking it as like, oh, I'm just going to like show up and try out um, and try to figure this out along the way. Um, it's something that when it comes to us making the comment of the stage will always be there, know that it is not embarrassing to work on something before you get up on stage. If I I could go back in time and make something quote perfect it would be to truly train and track and figure things out before allowing prep to come into the equation that doesn't mean that you can't diet it doesn't mean you can't have physique goals or aesthetic goals it doesn't mean any of that and it doesn't make you less of a competitor um for waiting to get on stage instead of just getting on so you can say that you've competed before. Um, because it is something that the, what I've learned is I, I, I've wasted money. I've wasted time along the way, but I've been able to get to this point that I'm at now. And it's really great to be able to see, okay, there are all these different things that I could have done differently. Um, and now I'm able to kind of use that wisdom to talk to other people for things that I didn't see when I first got started. And I know that's kind of a place where we're all coming from is we've, we've interacted with first time competitors, we've interacted with people who are in similar spots as us. And it is something that we really are coming from experience of working with people and going through it ourselves of knowing, hey, this is something that if I could go back in time and change, like this would be what I changed. Um, so just being able to really take that and stride of these aren't just things that we're saying because we stand on some high mighty mountain. Um, it's because we want you to not make the same mistakes that we've made and be able to see successes um, in, in those steps as you move forward. So Alex, do you want to dig into just that um, experience that you should have within training and tracking before entering a prep? Sure. Uh, within the nutrition aspect, actually yesterday, I had a sales call with a uh, inquiring contest prep client and her first coach actually sold her on competing to learn how to track. She, he, he prefaced it as a great time to learn about her nutrition and those different factors. Um, and, and I could not disagree more in that context of trying to figure out how to track your food while also being aggressively hungry, because I'm sure that the, the deficit that was created by said coach was probably uh, quite um, deep 
or steep, if you will. Or um, and so within that, uh, having that base of of knowledge within your nutrition and time under your belt within tracking food, it's going to come from repetitions, just just as training is and quality of repetitions within those reps that you're getting. So getting days of tracking under your belt um, and having the experiences of um, okay, I went out to eat and I tried to track this food. I have a better understanding of of eyeballing these things and and paying attention when you are tracking your food in terms of the quantity of food that's there, because you're not always going to have the luxury of having your scale or things that you specifically weigh out and and you want to within prep, but there are circumstances where that's not going to be the case. You're going to have things come up. Thus, with that paying attention, you're going to have an idea of how much chicken is four ounces, how much turkey is six ounces and those different things. And so having that base of knowledge is only going to help you because at the time of contest prep, now your your room for error becomes very, very small. And so there's not a, a an opportunity for you to say, shucks, I thought it was, I thought it was three ounces. It was actually eight. I, you know, I didn't know. And now I went over my protein. I went over my fat, what have you. And so then you're just running into these obstacles that are just things that you can avoid, um, prior to getting into the prep itself. I think a good way to, uh, another good follow-up question to that, uh, that I'll kind of pose to both of you is, um, you know, one thing that I always, if I get these questions, it's, it's all of what we talked about so far, but also do you have time in your schedule to make this priority for the next six months, you know, or do you have, <clears throat> is it a thing where it's like, oh no, I have, I have kind of eight weeks where I know I'm going to be free and then my life gets cr super crazy again. And if that's the case that this may not be the right time to, to maybe you can start towards the process. You can get into, get with your coach. You can start working towards these you know, establishing your training and nutrition protocols and things that you're, how your body's responding and forming a relationship for the future. But if you only have like two free months here of like, well, I have two months to dedicate to this. It's not the right thing. That's probably not the right goal for this time. Right. So, um, what would you guys' advice be on, on timelines and, and all of that, as far as, you know, if I'm looking to do my first show, how much time should I maybe project or maybe potentially give myself to, to work towards this goal? Yeah, I think that's a great question. We will have linked in the show notes. I do have a post talking about when to find out the right time to compete. And I talk about the concept that there's probably never going to be a perfect time um, in life to compete. But I kind of go through a few different things to keep in mind. And we'll talk through some of them here. But it's a great post to refer back to. Um, but I think that if you're able to truly have these conversations with a coach, you can figure out what that looks like for time frame. Um, so it is something where we've had clients come to us and say, hey, I want to compete. What does this look like? Or I'm interested. And I've said, hey, it's going to be a minimum of a year of really getting things down before we even discuss a prep. Um, and so that is something that you, again, if you're able to have those questions going into a conversation with a coach, you can mentally prepare yourself for what's to come. And that's going to help you overall with your adherence, your consistency, and reaching that goal because you're not in your head thinking, oh, this is all going to happen in two months or I'm going to get on stage in the next few months. You know what that looks like. Um, but other things that I would say is to kind of be aware of what financial things you have coming up and what that looks like for your budget. Also to be able to look at, I mean, holidays, travel, work events, life events that are coming up um, and your mental capacity to handle all of that. So for example, right now, um, Alex and I will be moving this month. Um, we have been, we just brought on two new coaches, which were announced um, this past two weeks. Um, there's been a lot going on on top of that. And so if you were to tell me to start a prep or even a diet right now, I would be like, hey, listen, I need a little bit of space. I don't have the capacity to do that and to make it the priority that it needs. So it does take some self-reflection on that for sure. Um, but also looking ahead, or, or having conversations with those around you. I know that we've done podcasts talking about the the relationships and what a toll that is on other people, but truly being able to have a real conversation about that, um, about what that's going to bring, what is going to be expected of that other person, what you are going to be going through during that time, how much time you're going to have to devote to different spaces. Um, so I think that a big part is just having a lot of conversations and also doing a lot of self-reflecting and then having um, the coach's opinion as well. Okay. That was a lot in, in the... <laughs> 
response to that. I would say in terms of the timeline to, to visit that first, I, at bare minimum, I like to spend three months with the client or 12 weeks prior to them getting into the prep. It gives me an opportunity to get some data points within their training, within their nutrition, um, what their adherence is like, because there are times that, that athletes come to me and in that first three months, they're like, okay, we've already, we've established that we're going to try to head into prep at the end of this and adherence is wavering. Some life things happen. Um, and, and then it's a, an easy time for us to say, okay, we're not going to get into this prep. We're going to continue to, to try and grow or improve body composition to later get into the prep itself. Um, so at the base, that three months, and then within the prep, you're probably looking at 16 to 20 weeks within that initial prep for yourself. Give yourself more time. An easy rule of thumb is going to be a rough idea of how many pounds you need to lose to get into stage conditioning. And this is going to be an estimate because you don't know what getting peeled is going to look like for you from a scale perspective. It's probably lower than what you think. And so within this, have a rough idea with your coach. Your coach is going to have that reference point there for you and then add two to four uh, weeks on top of that. So it's a one pound per week type initiative and then adding two to four weeks, depending on what that looks like. And maybe you're like, I need to lose 30 pounds. Great. This is a, a situation where you're going to have to break this up into phases. Competing is not in your near future having to lose the 30 pounds. And I know that that's hard to hear. And like, well, I see, I see these posts of individuals losing 30 pounds and looking amazing on stage. And within that, the, the healthier approach is going to be, let's cut that down to losing 15 pounds and then get you back to a caloric maintenance. And then we address the next 15 pounds in a, in a greater time frame, And that's when we would compete. So whatever that timetable looks like, you'll be much happier with the results. You'll be able to retain a greater density of muscle tissue, and it will look significantly better on you. You have to understand that the elastin within your skin has to correlate with the speed in which you are losing said body fat. And so if you go through this very drastic factor, fat loss and have 30 pounds lost in 16 weeks, let's say 14 weeks, something crazy within that it's going to look, you're just going to kind of constantly look a little watery because the skin has not inherently caught up with the fat loss that has transpired. And so that's a big piece of the puzzle as well. When you're looking at that and in speaking to the, um, environment component of things where the budget and, and things going on within, um, your life as well as family and, and those different aspects do your best to convey to them what this means to you, as well as um, the the adversity that's going to come up. You don't inha- you don't know because it's your first time, but just be open with them of like, hey, this is very important to me. I'm going to deal with some things. I may be a little bit more short fused at times. I may um, have to be more selfish throughout this period. Not may you will have to be a little bit more selfish through that period. Um, and, and conveying that to them early on, because for a, a significant other, a family member to just kind of be thrust into that without any understanding of it prior is very challenging on them. And so that's a, a big, I know we've talked about that on like a multitude of podcasts, so I don't yeah. want to rehash that. Too but much, be, but. be willing to take criticism in that situation. I mean, it's been something that's very, th- I'm very thankful for of uh, through my last prep, there was a time where I was being I, I was much better through my last prep, like night and day than my prep before that. Um, but my last prep, there was a point that things were starting to just mentally weigh on me. And Alex was just like, hey, you're not acting the way that I know you want to act or the way that's you. Like we need to rehash this. And so instead of just kind of being like, this is prep and you don't need to get in my face, um, being able to be um, receptive to a conversation um, and really being able to be understanding. Because like I talked about it in the episode where we do the lack, we talked about the lack of support on your fitness journey. Sometimes people just don't know what they don't know. And you have to be willing to be patient with them to because they're they're going through this experience for the first time as well um, and be able to realize that even though you are having to be selfish, be a little bit nicer in that situation that they're going through this as well. Yeah. And, you know, to that point, too, it's like I've had this conversation recently. It was, you know, you're not going to or a good way to think about this, at least for me, is like you're not going to war here. Like we aren't going to war like we are going into something that's really challenging. It's going to take a lot out of you and it's going to ask a lot of yourself and, and those around you, but we're not, we're not sacrificing at all costs here. And that's extremely important to understand that every, not only are you going through something challenging, but if you're not 
coming from this world or you haven't, you know, talked about this to your significant other for years upon years of them kind of knowing what this is and, and knowing what to expect, this is going to be a huge, huge curveball in everything that you guys do, you know, whether it's down to date night or down to, you know, if you guys have kids, sex like drive. how you're going <laughs> to, yeah, sex. I mean, everything, like everything changes here and understand that you as the person going through prep, like going through my preps, I had to really have those moments where it's like, all right, you may have to just act like you're in a great mood right now, even though you would much rather be anywhere else and probably by yourself. Right. And it's like, you're just going to have to play the part, man. Just act like you're stoked. Act like you just, whether you feel like being kind or not, just be kind, be patient. And it's like, as you get deeper into preps and, and get into the really, the, the really challenging parts of this experience, you really have to show up again as that best version of yourself, um, especially throughout the, the, the later weeks of that prep, um, too. But also if this is, this is a situation where you're completely just like turning your life upside down, this is a completely new thing, not only to you, but your significant other and your, your whole family, there needs to be some, maybe some gradual uh, uptick to to these efforts, some gradual uptick to these changes in your life. And I can promise you that this is going to be a better experience long term if you do that work and communication up front rather than during the process, right? Because this is not a situation where we're sacrificing at all costs because that means at all costs would mean, okay, well, I don't care if my relationship hangs on. I don't care if my, my kids like me. I don't care if my job... You know, I, I don't care if I get fired, I'm going to be shredded on stage. And it's like, no one lives like that, right? Like we can't approach this situation like that. Um, so I don't know, it, mentally for me, it's like, it's important to know, like to have a mentality of, of like, let's win, let's be the best we can. And let's, let's do this hundred percent. But that does not come at the sacrifice of all things, right? This isn't going to war. So I, I think there's a, a really important distinction um, and alongside what I'll finish there is like, you're, you're, this is a fun process too, right? And you can approach it in two different ways where you're the woe is me victim of your circumstance that you chose, or you're approaching this as like, I'm about to learn so much about myself. And in these moments where I'm really, really challenged, who shows up, right? Who is that person that shows up? And I'm, am I a better person or am I a worse off person? Right, because I think there's there's two individuals that come out on the other side of contest prep, and that's either a person who completely changes their life for the better, in terms of who they act, how they act, how they act towards others in times of adversity or, or when you're tired or don't want to show up as that person, or you go the other way, right? And you you turn everyone away, you turn everyone off, and you shut life out just to sacrifice for you know quote unquote stage conditioning. And if that, that sounds silly to you, it is silly, but people do it every single year. Right. And it's really sad to see. Um, and I've, I've known people to do it. We've all been around. If you've competed before, you've all been around people who've chose that route over the one, over the other one that we mentioned, right. Over becoming just better versions of yourself. Right. Cause there's so much that you can learn. And I can tell you that the prep where you have that better attitude is the prep that goes a whole hell of a lot better as well. Um, the one that you can take that perspective, that you can be kind to those around you. Uh, because the the prep where I was so stressed out and we were planning a wedding and planning a move, and I was, I was mean to people that I cared about. And that was really hard post prep to realize that I did that. And I really didn't have a reason to do that. And it showed me and we talk, we'll talk about it more, but it shows you who you are. And you're able to see exactly what Austin said of those moments when you're hungry, those moments when you're tired, those moments when you're so frustrated, or so worn down, what person do you show up as? Um, so it is important to keep that in mind. But 
And before I get too sappy, um, we did talk about um, budget here. And I would say to budget a minimum of $3,000. Now, this is something that that might seem like a high price. And it's not something that you pay all at once. This is including um, things like your coach, your MPC card, or your federation card, your classes, paying for hotels, for hair, for makeup, all of that jazz. Um, and if you are a physique development client, we do have a budget price list. So you can just ask your coach for it and we'll get it to you. Um, but it is something that I would say a minimum of $3,000. Now, I would personally save around $5,000 just because I'd much rather have extra afterwards and be like, sweet, I, I have money left over than get to the end and kind of have to cut costs on things that I shouldn't cut costs on after everything I've poured into this um, because it's something, and Alex can touch on it if he wants to, as far as spending money throughout prep. If you get to the end and you're kind of like, well, I'm out of it, you have just spent all of this time devoted to showing up the best that you can on stage. And then you might realize like, I can't show up the best, whether it's due to the stress of that money or due to, um, I don't have the money to get me there, whatever that may be, being able to take that into consideration as well. Yeah. I think the only thing I'll add is that when you're selecting that first show with your coach, pick a string of three shows that are within uh, driving ability for you or what have you within kind of a, a month or two months time to allow for, um, potentially you're not ready for that first show. That could be a case. I mean, that could very well be a case things happen and you may have to push off to the second show. Um, the other thing is, is that putting in, you know, 16 to, to 20 hard weeks of dieting and getting all your cardio in and, and really sacrificing a lot throughout that time. It's hard to get up there one time, especially within divisions like bikini and, and men's physique, where your time on stage is significantly sh shorter than other divisions. If you're in men's bodybuilding, you're in, um, figure or, or physique within women's, you do have longer spurts of time on stage. You have a, an individual minute to get up there and, and pose and, and have a full routine. Um, so within competing just one time in a season, it can be challenging of like, damn, I, I just poured in 20 weeks of, of time and I was up there for maybe five minutes and, and you don't know who's going to show up to that show as well. One of the more defeating things that I, I hate to see for competitors when they come uh, to us is that the show is super small or they try to extend the classes too much where they have very small groups and they only have one person they compete against uh, for that class. And it's like, well, that was interesting. I just, you know, I did the same thing that I've been doing this for the 20 weeks and just was up there under the bright lights and nothing really changed. Um, so that can be something to, to pay attention to as well. Um, so getting into your prep, some things as far as routine and scheduling, what would be one of your biggest tips for routine and scheduling, Alex? Uh, you know, for 16 to 20 weeks, it's going to, the, the best way for you to be successful is kind of turning this into groundhog day every single day, having a, a protocol in place and a, a schedule in front of you rather than trying to get things in on the fly, especially with this new stimulus for you to be in this prep and, and, and having this high priority, um, making it a priority within your schedule to prioritize your cardio, to prioritize your training, to have an understanding of when is the best time for you to consume foods for your digestion, as well as your performance within the gym. Those things are going to be big for yourself. And once you get into that routine, things get a little bit like if there was ever a time that things get easier within a prep is that is when you construct a routine and a schedule that is you're able to adhere to throughout that whole process and within your nutrition as well. I think that that's a, a big thing is that people uh, within their first prep try to get a little too cute with things uh, <laughs> within the foods that they're selecting. And we'll talk about um you know, whole foods being or, or quality of foods being more important than these macro friendly, like desserts that you can fit into your macros. But like, what is that going to do from a digestive stress perspective? Um, I think that the routine is, and also this is something that for me, um, I was kind of forced into as a, as a kid where my routine and my schedule was just crazy because of multiple sports being at school. There was never really a time for me that I needed to schedule because it was so crazy that any spare moment was already taken up by something else. So I got out of, I was in college and, and had played college baseball at the time. So that was thrusting me into a schedule that was forced upon me. And so coming out of playing college baseball, I was in a position where it's like, man, I've never had to you know, schedule myself and, and the discipline has been almost 
forced upon me because of the things that I had already, you know, there to attend to. And now I am my, I am, I have a coach, but he's not with me, right? You're, you're doing this online nine times out of 10. So you're your own authority throughout that day to attend, get your cardio done, get your training done, those different factors. So having that routine is like one of the best things that I got out of my first prep for myself and, and having more structure to my day as a whole. Yeah. Kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. Um, the more that you can create the, those systems and put them into place, the easier it becomes because it's not guesswork. You're just executing. And executing is a whole lot easier than trying to figure it out each day. Um, it's the same thing with food. It's the same thing with training. It's the same thing with all of it. Um, that if you just plan it in your day and already know kind of what the day, what when you need food, when you need a pack of meal for some place, um, and you know all of that, that's where you're going to succeed. And that's where the scheduling is going to be get, getting really easy. If you start each day, like, hmm, am I going to do cardio in the morning or in the evening? Should I train now or later? Um, or not knowing what's going on, that's where you're really going to pigeonhole yourself. So um, Austin, do you have any tips or top advice that you'd give for routine or scheduling? Uh, just exactly uh, what you guys said. I mean, uh, I did all my competing when I was in in university and I, I think I would struggle pretty, <laughs> I would struggle a lot today, I think, to piece it all together in my own life currently. I'd have to really restructure some things and, and prioritize more than I do now for my own training. Um, but like what college does and, and what university did is, you know, we, I know for Alex it was around the same time and it just forces you into non-negotiables, right? Uh, so for myself, it was, well, this is the only time I have to train or to do cardio. Um, you know, I have, all right, when I wake up, I have 30 minutes to, to cook and eat, eat breakfast. So I got to make it not only macro friendly, but, but easy and quick to, to make and eat and consume and then whatever else, and then get out the door. And then the same with like my snack, same with my lunch every day, my dinner every day. Um, and there was just these, these non-negotiables that I had. Um, but being proactive and being almost forced into that discipline through just being so busy with everything else. But I will say that is, I mean, still to this day, the most productive time I would say I've ever had in my life of getting, feeling great, feeling physically strong, feeling very physically healthy, um, but being men like feeling mentally strong too. Like, damn, like every single day I'm just getting... I just felt great. Like I, I'm getting so much done and I'm not distracted. There wasn't enough time to be distracted. It was just like, I didn't even think about whatever it was. I was just like, all right, this is what I do at this time. This is what I do at this time. This is what I do at this time. And it was a non-negotiable. Um, and then the same goes for food, as you guys mentioned. I mean, I remember when I was living with my brother, um, you know, he, he'd always, he just, <laughs> he's not from this, this uh, world. And he would, he would always joke, obviously, and then bust my balls a bit. But, um, you know, I remember each morning it was kind of like he would always come in and be like, which breakfast you got today? You know, is it breakfast A or breakfast B? Because I remember I had my breakfast like written down and like on the fridge of like this was breakfast A, this was breakfast option B. So depending on how I felt that day, if it needed to be quick or if I had a little bit longer, but they were broken down to like, you know, obviously how quick they could be done. Um, the macros of that and, you know, all of that stuff, but also prioritize of like, I know I digest these two meals really, really well. And I know I got to, they have to digest it in this amount of time because after this class I go train and do cardio. And it's just, when you really get things in set in stone there with a routine, your life just becomes so much easier. Right. And this goes to, you know, if, there is a lot of decision fatigue that's taken away if you wear the same thing every every day right there's this there's the decision fatigue that's taken away if you're just creating a good structure and schedule for not only for yourself um your physical self but your mental and emotional self as well it really kind of just falls into place and it's one of those things where if you're ticking those boxes every single day based off of that structure and schedule and you're, you're making sure you're checking in with this person you, you've hired to help out you're going to look up in six to eight weeks and and be really in my experience, really pleasantly surprised, not only with your efforts, um, but the way that you're progressing and, and moving towards that goal, right? So um, yeah, I think scheduling and um, 
creating a timeline for yourself and, and non-negotiables for yourself uh, makes your life a lot more easier than I think you may be assuming it would if you haven't done this quite yet. But And one thing I will say within scheduling um, is that if you time how long it takes you to do average tasks, so kind of what Austin was talking through of, oh, if I knew I had enough time for breakfast or if it digested in time. For example, I went on a walk this morning. I knew if I had to walk the dogs, um, I needed to be able to make breakfast by 9 a.m. to be able to meet my friend at 10 a.m. to go for the walk. So I knew I had to prep my breakfast by 8, go on the walk with the dogs before 8.30 to be able to have my breakfast and to have that all happen. And if I didn't know the average times for those tasks, then I could have thought, oh, I could just get this all done and then go and do X, Y, and Z and be radically behind or not hit the plan that I needed. So being able to time yourself doing average tasks, how long does it take you to do your morning vacuums? How long does it take you to make your meal? How long does it take you to package your meal, to get dressed, to get out the door? How long is it going to take to digest that meal? Knowing all those metrics is going to make that building out that schedule so, so, so much easier for for you. Um, so Alex, should I go and ask my friends how my prep is going or um, ask their coaches how they think I'm doing while I'm prepping? Probably a good idea. Not a good idea. Uh, this is unfortunately something that's coming, uh, becoming a little bit more common within social media because uh, with you know, long durations of cardio, you do have some time to scroll uh, social media, Instagram, Twitter, those different things. And you can see what other coaches are, are speaking to. Maybe they had you identify with another bikini competitor or, or whatever division you're in. You're like, you know what? That worked for them. I probably, I should think about doing that as well. Or you find a situation where you, you meet some friction within your fat loss. You've hit a, a plateau within your coach. Now you immediately are, are seeking validation from other individuals, whether that be coaches, friends who have competed before, anything like that. And they make recommendations. They, I mean, they could truthfully just be giving some general advice and answering your question, but that's only creating more friction to a situation that's already being, um, you know, handled by your coach at that time. And so what I encourage and, and one thing that we speak to all of our clients about is that uh, we do not want too many cooks in the kitchen. Uh, there, there's a reason that you you hired us. There's a reason that you pay the price that you do to be able to get to the stage conditioning that we are, are working towards to be uh, victorious on that stage. And so by adding in those other opinions, you're doing yourself a disservice by you're, you're paying this price for the, the coach to be able to handle the, the process for you. But now you're trying to figure it out yourself. Yourself. And oftentimes this comes from a place of like just wanting to help and wanting to get it figured out so that uh, we can move past the plateau or what have you. But oftentimes this just creates more confusion as well as um, just constantly trying to uh, find a reason for things or find a different way to do things is not oftentimes the, the case. And more often than not, it's just a matter of sticking to the plan and you're going to break through that plateau or that, you know, changing a few different variables, what have you. But the big thing is that your your prep is yours and your coaches. Of course, um, you, your your family is going to be supportive in those different factors or you want them to be. But um, in terms of input of, of adjustment to protocols and those things, leave that up to your coach. And that comes with that trust and those different factors come with spending the time on the calls prior and working with that coach to understand uh, their principles and those different factors. And, and obviously asking questions as well is going to be important throughout the process too. So the grass isn't always greener. That is correct. Interesting. Um, but so since I can't ask other coaches um, their opinions or ask other competitors, I should at least scroll on social media about other competitors doing my show or other competitors in prep to make sure I'm on the right timeline, right? No. Uh, oh, man, I'm really messing this stuff up. Aud auditing your social <laughs> media is going to be a big part of your prep as well. Uh, because if you get caught up in this comparison game of, of seeing other competitors who are doing your show or what have you, uh, it's, it's not going to be beneficial for you. The the organic way of, of the human brain is that you're going to really see the other people, um, the, the strengths that they have. You're not going to see very many weaknesses in other individuals. You're going to be very self-critical of the weaknesses that you have. And if they have the strengths within your weaknesses within these other competitors, it is going to be very negative for you of like, well, they're, they're already so much better than me and, and so on and so forth. Or they're at a, they're leaner than me at this stage of the prep. And it just becomes 
a, a lot of, um, uh, it becomes an issue from a mental health perspective. And that is one thing within your first prep, every prep that you ever have, mental health is going to be the the first priority here because it is going to be a very challenging time for you in terms of um, your body composition changing, your clothes fitting differently, uh, how you are mentally feeling in terms of brain fog, potentially, uh, you know, speaking and, and losing your train of thought in the middle of a, a, a a, a sentence or things of that nature. You have a lot of things going on. So the things that you can control being social media, one of them or a large one, really handle that to your best ability. And if you are still following uh, individuals who compete on your Instagram and those things, use that as motivation. I know that there are like for the bikini competitors that we have, I, I really push them to use the the pros and the standard as kind of this motivation of like, this is achievable. I, I can, I can be in that spot rather than, well, this pro who's been competing for eight years <laughs> is so far ahead of me. There's no way I ever get there. It's like, no, no, use this as like, this person's done it. So anybody can do it in, in, in theory. Right. And so with the, the proper work and those things, so seeing it as motivation rather than this comparison game. Yeah. And in that post, I talked about that there's going to be a post linked where I talk about if it's the right time to compete, but I also have a post linked talking about the timeline for competing. So if you are a first time competitor and you're like, well, I'm only comparing myself to another first time competitor. So that's fair game. I'm not comparing myself to someone who's eight chapters ahead of me. But you have to realize each person and their life experience up to that point is so extremely different. If I take, for example, Austin and I, Austin, one of the first time he competes, well, every show he's done, he's like one and he turned pro and it was this like, so to speak, easy trajectory. And it was his first time and he just got it done. Meanwhile, I've been at it for five years and I'm still an amateur and I haven't won a show and I haven't won a class. And it's been pretty defeating in that, or I could let that be pre pretty defeating in that and just compare, well, we're both first time competitors. So why didn't my story end the same way? But I have to take into consideration Austin's genetics are completely different than mine. Austin's training history, even though he wasn't competing before is completely different than mine. His athletic ability from before that in the sports he did completely different than mine, his metabolism, all these different things. And you could, of course, take it a step further of male versus female, but I'm using it for an example within this scenario, within this podcast. But comparing yourself in those instances never, ever, ever helps in the regard of just saying, well, tit for tat and we're the same amount of weeks out and I should look this way because it's also something that people lose fat differently. They also display things on social media very differently. Um, and so it is something where you might be like, well, her legs are really lean, but your legs might be getting there. They just need some more time. And if you're constantly comparing yourself and picking that apart, that's going to pull you back further and further. And it's something that we have noticed time and time again, the competitors that spend too much time on social media and talk too much about other people are the ones that mentally cannot get out of their own way to keep moving forward. And I'll, I'll toot Austin's horn just for a little bit longer is that uh, for those that do not know, Austin and I went to high school together. And so I was a year behind Austin and I come in as a freshman in high school and um, I come into the weight room at, at, well, if you've listened to the podcast, I've talked about this, I'm maybe 120 pounds at the absolute maximum my freshman year of high school. And so I am very starstruck as I walk into the weight room as a freshman with the, the varsity, like with the seniors, the juniors and all that. And so we had a lot of very strong individuals on our team. Strength training was a, a very strong suit for our high school in general. We were very well led. And as my freshman year, I see Austin. Uh, I was familiar with Austin. We were not friends at the time, but I was familiar with who he was. We had run around with the same crowd of people. And Austin, as a sophomore in high school, so he's just a year older than me, as a sophomore in high school is training with the varsity for one. So that's already like W2, like what in the world? Mm -hmm. And then also he's training with the seniors and, and, and matching them to a point where it's like, man, I don't know if you should be this strong, but it's wild <laughs> that you are this strong within the, the movements that they, you know, bench press and, and, and back squat and, and power cleans and, and the movements that you would have from a sports perspective. Um, so that was something that he would, he would never tell that story probably, but it was something that, uh, you know, just to speak to Austin's kind of background, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about Austin, the, the pro of the group.
(laughs) (laughs) Gonna make me blush. Um, The uh, also to extend on that point, uh, not my own point, or not about me, but (laughs) about like see um, social media, (laughs) Um, like people that like I remember from my own preps, like I would I remember sending countless photos to Alex from guys that I was about to compete against, and I would completely psych myself out and. These guys were capturing the best of the best angles. These guys looked 30 pounds heavier than they ended up being on stage. And like, if we were to have an Instagram physique show, I would have not won a show in my opinion. Like, I think I, you know, I looked whatever, but like compared to how these other guys looked who I was competing against it, like it didn't even look like a competition. Um, and I was that always psyched myself out. I always went in super nervous and comparing myself to these people, even though I knew better, right? I, I, know, I know I knew better, I know better now, um, but I even knew at the time not to do this, but you know, it's really hard to turn that side of your brain off. And I, I think it's only natural to do it if you expose yourself to it. But these folks, it's, it's very rare that someone looks as good or better in real life on average than they do on social media. So remember, especially what they're showing you on social media, right? Know that that competitor that is showing that like gym selfie, like probably took 35 of those and you're seeing one of one of the screen captures from a video that was like, all right, I found the right lighting. I'm close enough to the camera and and this is all great. Um, And all right, now I look the leanest, I look the most shredded, you know, and even back in my day, it was all about the filters, right? It was all about that. (laughs) <laughs> that uh what was it the structure and contrast and all yeah. that structure. stuff so <laughs> the structure on uh the instagram filters but um it, it just it's so unhelpful just to kind of just solidify that point and you know you, obviously you can use that as motivation you know to, to make you push a little harder and there were times where you know i i gave more to my cardio sessions i gave more to the end of my sessions when i was tired you know i i, I went for late night sessions when i didn't want to when i blew off my session all day. And then I saw someone's post or I, I looked, you know, I saw myself in the mirror and I'm just like, no, nope, I'm going, I'm doing this. I don't care. You know, I don't care if I have to be up in five hours, I'm going right now. Um, right. And like, whether that was great, the best for my physique at the time is negotiable, but it's, it's the, the mentality you take to it. Right. So, um, what you, or the competitor, what they're showing on social media, and if it, even if it looks great on social, also doesn't mean it's going to translate well to the stage. And I, I brought up this point to kind of say that where <clears throat> luckily and very fortunately, my physique looked better on stage than it did on Instagram or photos or anything else. Like forever how we, whether it was how we peaked or the fact that I am a, was a, am a natural competitor, was a natural competitor, um, you know, it, obviously there's, and we may get to this in this episode, but there's obviously the way that people look can evolve and change throughout their prep. Also, depending on what, uh, you know, maybe what PEDs they're using or whatever else. Um, and that again, can make them look, you know, way ahead of you or way ahead of schedule, making you nervous, or they look better on Instagram than they end up looking on stage. Um, so remember, this is a competition of what you're displaying on stage, not on social media. And I think that's a really, really important thing to know. Um, so yeah, that was my main, my main point. And also to detract all the attention away from, from me. Uh, <laughs> <For yourself. laughs> yeah. um, well, Austin did mention PED use, which we will go into here in a second, but I do want to go over three things that I think are extremely important because we did get the question about what's the hardest thing about competing that people don't think about, which I think is a great question. But with that question, it was something as far as like advice that you would give to a first time competitor that they might not be thinking about as well. Um, and so some of the smaller things that you might not be like, well, I hit my macros, I hit my cardio. So I'm following protocols 100%. It's more so of the quality of those foods, the quality of the sleep, managing your stress, um, and then posing. No matter what division it is, you need to practice posing. Learn from Austin's mistake of not knowing what, what he was doing going into it. If you didn't practice posing, everyone can tell. Everyone knows. The judges know. It's not going to go well for you. And if you think, well, I'm just about 
the lifting and the the hard and the the food and the posing is just whatever, then get out of the sport. You don't need to be in the sport if you don't care about a whole aspect of the sport. Um, it's something that it's not the best physique that wins. It's the best presented physique that wins. Um, so if you don't know how to present your f- physique, if you do not look fluid on stage, that can really detract and that can take away. And if you just overlook that and say, well, I hit my cardio, I hit my training, I hit my food, that's really going to take away from your experience, how you do at the show um, and how you like your stage shots as well. Um, So really honing in on those things as far as posing, the quality of food, um, managing stress, focusing on sleep, meal timing, those smaller things that you think aren't as important, that's when these are the most important. Yeah. And I'll add to that. And there's been two scenarios in this season specifically where I've had judges tell me post show or, or after the fact that the conditioning was matched by the athlete that we had on stage, but their posing was superior to that individual. Thus, they got the nod to, to win the class. And, and one of those individuals actually ended up going t- on to win the overall um, in that specific show. And so the, the posing is, is such a, a, a big piece of the puzzle that individuals want to look past and kind of continue to push off because, well, I'm not in stage conditioning yet. And well, if, if that's the case, you may only be practicing posing for two weeks. I mean, if, if you're waiting to, to look a certain way and, and to uh, be peeled to the bone, you may only get you know ten sessions in before your show, and that's not near enough, especially with the fluidity within the posing, being able to hold posing. Mm-hmm. I can always tell by the the athletes who are, are bitching and moaning about being sore and oh my gosh, I, I've never held poses that long mm-hmm. when they're at a regional show. That's when I know that they have not put in a dime worth of the time that I was asking of them throughout that prep. And so the the individuals who can on that Sunday following the show who are uh, tender, but they've they've done this. They've walked themselves through this. I know that I'll use McKenzie as an example just from this season where, where her and, and Brandon every single night went through an hour of posing. And so when she got on stage this year, it was effortless. Mia's another one. Those are those are two. Mm-hmm. Sable's another one. Just coming off the top of my head, there's other athletes, of course. But Alex those, Brown. Right. Th- those those four really stick out in my mind of like, as soon as they got on stage, you whoever is able to look like a statue when they hit their poses is probably going to win the class. Like if you can hold and stay in that positioning and not fidget. Fidgeting is the most distracting thing within mm-hmm. posing. And you see it more... I, 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 I feel like I see it more within men's divisions where they're fidgeting a bunch, mm-hmm. where with, with women's divisions, they're kind of, especially within bikini, they're kind of f- fidgeting with their hands, but within men's divisions, they're moving more so their entire body. But fidgeting is the, one of the most distracting things when you're trying to compare physiques, because if, if it's between you and another athlete and you guys are up for first place and they're looking at the other athlete and then they look at you, you could be in the middle of a fidget. And it's like, well, you missed your opportunity. I'm back to this person and they're just standing like a statue. And I get to look at how, how are their glutes looking? How are their hamstrings looking? Um, so many more details to that physique rather than looking over and being like, well, they're still fidgeting. So I'm back over here. Um, it, it's a huge uh, way to really separate yourself from the field. And this uh, also goes in tune with what we were saying as far as going to a show. Because if you just see someone's curated footage on YouTube, or you just see someone's still image on NPC News Online or on their Instagram, you might be like, that person easily won. Why did that person do X, Y, and Z? And if you're at the shows, I can tell you it is damn easy to tell who the winner is. Because once you're there, when you see the posing live, it is extremely easy to tell who is the winner. Pictures do not tell the full story at all. Um, It's those videos that you get to see how that person's body moves moves in general, and then how well they've practiced their posing. Um, And it's something that I mean, they just gave away what it's $30,000 for someone being the best poser. So I mean, you also have that to look forward to if you if you're really wanting to, you know, the second biggest show of the entire (laughs) well, you know what (laughs) I'm saying, the posing (laughs) is a big aspect. And you should pay attention to it. And that's another thing that you will see going to shows that you'll really be able to discern who practiced, who didn't, who looks good, who didn't. In it. And like Alex said, we have had judges tell us point blank, hey, the posing really knocked that person up. Um, and even judges giving the feedback to clients themselves of saying like, hey, your posing really edged you up here because you presented it really well. 
So focus on those things. So do you want to touch on and managing stress? Um, but do you want to touch on PED use? And then we'll ask the last two questions. Yeah, I can be brief here. So within PED use, within first time competitors, I would very much so try to steer clear of this for a multitude of reasons. One, uh, you don't know if this is going to be something that you want to do for the long haul. If you're going to compromise your your health potentially within the PED use that you're wanting to put into place and, and the potential, uh, you know, side effects that you could experience over the long haul for men specifically for so for example if they're going to use exogenous testosterone uh, throughout their uh, throughout their prep it, it could shut off their their natural production for the remainder of their life and there's athletes who uh, I've spoken to who were were told to take testosterone at a, a very young age in terms of competing you know 21 22 years old and they are now on TRT from that point until they they pass away. And that, that's a very hard pill to swallow to realize that you are going to have to take a, at least one to two shots a week for the remainder of your life. And so understanding that and, and being very conscious of that within your PED use for, for men specifically on that topic, but with women as well, where it can be very um, easy of, of your coach to be like, okay, let's take X, Y, and Z. Anivar and, and Clembuterol are going to be your, your first two tip of the iceberg type products where both of them are going to be uh, taken orally. So they're not going to be injectables or anything of that nature. And so it's a little bit easier of like, I just took a pill and that's all that's happening. But in reality, if you are interested in PDs, one, spend time educating, ask your coach questions. Those are going to be the, the big pieces of the puzzle and feel very confident in that decision. But within first time competitors, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that that's not the case because within that, outside of the, the health concerns that it can bring on, also for every prep following that, you will feel as though that you're dependent on those variables. So if the, in future preps, you're like, well, as soon as I get the clean in place, now I'll be, you know, getting into crazy shape. As soon as I get the Anavar in place, I'll be in crazy shape. And so it'll put this kind of like, uh, mechanism in place where if if you don't have those in it's like uh, I'm kind of I'm I'm in limbo or I'm giving about 90% until I have those variables in now that those variables are in I'm giving 100% effort and so that's not how you want to play the game at all because that's just not going to be a successful prep um so and if you've never gone through a prep before, you don't know what your body can do. And not to get into the whole conversation of you should reach your full potential naturally before you use PEDs. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, is a first prep is enough to go through. Get through that and then make decisions from there. And again, it's not us standing on a high mountain. It's just something that um, we really take inventory of, of not just pushing something to push it or for someone to be um, that better aspect. Um, and something else I will mention, because I know Alex has said this to me, if you choose to go the natural route, be okay with that decision and do not let that be something that's running in the back of your head of, well, they're doing better because they're enhanced in X, Y, and Z. Because if you have that mentality, again, it's going to hold you back. So know that you can do a lot naturally if you choose to do. You can do a lot with PEDs if you choose to. Just make sure that you do your research um, and make sure that you make the decision that's the best for you. Yeah. And, and with saying natural, there, there are going to be natural shows within the NPC. There are going to be natural federations that you can compete in. If you feel as though that, uh, you're in a situation where you're going to be very bitter when you are, uh, like competing against individuals who are going to be enhanced and you're like, well, I'm, I'm natural. Like they're going to beat me regardless. And you're kind of in this already victim or, or, or defeated state, it's not worth that. Go into the division that fits you more specifically if that's the case. Uh, because I, I, I'm sitting next to, well, in, <laughs> in cyberspace, I'm sitting next to two individuals who competed naturally. And, and I, I've, I've been alongside both of their competition journeys the entire time. There has never been a time within either of their their competitions, any of their competitions that I've heard them bitch and moan afterwards of like, well, everybody else was enhanced and like, that's the only reason I lost. And it's like, what good does that do for anyone? Um, because you knew that going into the show itself or should have a general understanding of that being the case going into the show. Yeah. And I mean, you can make great results with or without them. Just right. make the decision that's best for you. <laughs> um, so going into these last two questions, these are from a client. Um, so I'm going to ask both of them and then we're going to kind of answer them both. But question one is what is one of the hardest things about compete 
competing that people don't think about? And then what is one of the biggest frustrations as a coach? Um, so I know as far as the frustration wise, Alex probably is ready to go with something <laughs> for that. Uh, so you can answer one or both of those starting off. Uh, for the biggest frustration, I would just say lack of um, intention or intensity taken towards the the prep itself and just having lackluster focus towards that and, and um, not having 100% care within all the factors. So one thing that really grinds my gears, uh, there's, there's a handful of things, but one thing that's really <laughs> going to send me is the, the posing aspect. I cannot stand when an athlete, and, and it's something that I bring up within every check-in, um, we go over posing very abundantly. And if they're only posing that one time per week, it's very evident within the, the posing each week that we look at. And so that is one thing that's the most frustrating to me is that any of the controllable variables that are not controlled, and then we end up losing on on show day, or we, we are docked points because of those controllables falling short. Th those are things that are just like unacceptable to me. And so those are the things that's the biggest frustration for me. <laughs> I'll say, and this is going to be phrased a little bit weird. Well, lack of responsibility. So lack of realizing that, you know, what you're stepping into and you're not taking responsibility for the things that you need to get done. Um, but on the other edge of that, um, it's kind of the, um, well, I just lost my train of thought and I'm not even in prep. So Austin, you can go ahead and answer. And if I think of the other thing, I'll pop back in. That's all right. My brain's broken too. So um, the, for, the as far as like the frustration thing, I think where action falls short of the goals that you set with, with intention with your coach or your partner or, or yourself, right? And so that action falling short. So you not living up to the things that you said you were going to do. Um, and those be those things being in complete misalignment, right? So if every day or, you know, at the onset of your prep or the onset of you hiring a coach or, or you starting this journey, you set out to be the best version of yourself. You set out to, you know, okay, f you know, I'm going to be training five times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm going to wake up at 7am to do my cardio. And you have this, like, you have this, you know, simplified, but yet elaborate and comprehensive plan to get to that goal, or at least make strides towards that goal. And you don't do any of it, or you do 50% of it. And then, then you're frustrated. Then you're blaming someone else for your mistakes and not taking ownership over you not taking action towards that goal. And, and I think that's the, one of the most frustrating things. And also one of the most liberating things I learned at a very young age, um, really when I started to compete was everything is on you take full ownership, full self-responsibility for everything that you want to, you want to accomplish, you want to set out to do because no one else is here to do that work for you. And I think that's one of the most beautiful things about this sport is no matter how much money you have, no matter how many resources you have, you still have to do the work day in and day out to bring your best physique to the stage. And it shows right? Like I remember going to shows, especially early, early on. Well, shit, the whole time I competed, I didn't have any money. So I remember going <laughs> to these shows and you're, you're there with people who are, they're dining out large. You get all these, you know, especially when I got into the IFBB, it's like, you know, most of these are grown ass adults with real jobs. And so they're like, you know, they're showing up in their whatever else and they're getting fancy dinners and they got all their fancy equipment, all their fancy jumpsuits and bags. And I'm just trying to like scrap things together. I got that free from Fitmart three years ago. I'm getting nothing <laughs> matches. I'm just, you know, it's just, it is what it is. And right. None of that changed the fact that nothing that they had, no resources that they had on their end, no matter how fancy, no matter how expensive or, or whatever, no matter how great their coach was, they had to do that work, right? And, and the person who does the work and shows up and matches those actions to those goals was the, I mean, obviously there's context here, but usually came out on top, meaning like at least the top five, top 10 out of that show, right? Which in a pro show, top five, top, top 10, like that is, you're, you're cooking, like you're doing well, right? <laughs> you're you're winning, <laughs> right? Yeah, so I, I think that's one of my most frustrating things. Um, not only for, well, for myself or seeing other people. Yeah, go ahead if you got your thought. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of when it gets near the end of a prep or throughout a prep or even at the end of the prep and the competitor comes to the coach and says like, what do you think I still need to improve on? 
And the reason that I, I mentioned that question or I, what do you think the judge's feedback is going to be or something like that, it only frustrates me in a situation where someone has done the things that we've already talked about here because it's like you're wanting another answer for why things didn't go your way when you already know. And that circles back to not taking that responsibility. Um, and so it's something that just kind of settles in of like, you you still don't get it. You still don't understand that you had to take the actions daily. Um, and what I do want to say is the reason that these are frustrations for us is not necessarily because we don't have another win to put under our belt as coaches or because we don't look the best if our clients don't do the best. Of course, that impacts things and we all want to win. We all want to be impressive. But at the end of the day, as a coach, you pour in a lot to someone and to get them to that point, And especially if you've worked with a coach for a long time, time to get to that point is a lot of emotion going into it. And if you're not caring about it, it's very hard for the coach to just keep caring and keep showing up and doing more work than you're doing um, for the person who says they want to compete. So that's the reason that these are frustrations is because we want to be aligned with what your goals are, or what you want to accomplish. And if you tell me, I want to be the best version of myself. I want to win. I want to be successful. I take you at your word. And if you go in there and you're dilly dicking around or you're not giving your all or you're not making the best decisions for your digestion, whatever it may be, like you're now telling me that, hey, what I said, I'm not really going to do. So then that's why it's a huge frustration. Um, so just wanted to make sure that you're not just like, Wow, these people are frustrated. <laughs> um, there is a deeper reason behind that. So the last thing to wrap it up, and before we go on to a, a part two in a later time, um, is what's one thing that you think that people don't know going into a competition that's hard? Um, or I completely botched how that was originally phrased. Um, <laughs> but the the base of it, um, I would say that the a lot of people think about how physically hard it's going to be, um, but mentally it does does do a lot. And I think it does a lot of benefit. Each prep that I've been through has taught me more about who I am as a person, more about the person that I want to be, more about my capabilities. If you've heard me talk on podcasts one-on-one -on -one about what competing was, what my fitness journey has been, and we will be doing a fitness journey podcast for each of us as well. Um, but it was something that the first time I got into lifting, it showed me that I was capable. And so each prep since has shown me something new about myself a new side. It's pushed me to a new mental limit that I don't always get to push myself in a day-to-day -day situation. Um, and then the other aspect I would say is just kind of the... Um, how much it does affect those around you. The first prep I went through, I just thought this is just something I'm choosing to do. It doesn't really affect anyone else because it's my decision. It's me doing the work, but it did affect other people. And that's something that I wish I knew beforehand so that I could have taken a better approach for that. Yeah. Um, within the, the hardest thing that no one thinks about, I, I'm going to take a, a little bit of a different approach to the question as a whole. Um, and something that I bring up to first time competitors abundantly is that there is a five second window that feels like a small eternity when you're stepping on stage for that first time by yourself. And in that five seconds, you'll become very aware if you are, if you poured everything into that prep that you possibly could have all those moments of, I cut my cardio short at this time and I cut my cardio short this time and I under ate on this day and I over consumed on this day, all those thoughts, all those uh, experiences are all going to come to the surface at that very moment. It's going to be a very emotional moment for you to either realize that you did absolutely everything in your power to be the best in that instantaneous moment, or you're going to realize that there are things that you could have done differently. There are things that you should have tried harder at or, or shortcomings that transpired. And so understanding that before you even get into the prep and understanding that that moment is going to come where you have this moment with yourself of like, man, I, I and, and, and to get up there and have that five seconds of, damn it, I did absolutely everything I could have to be here. One, you're going to be so confident going into the, the posing for that, for that day. But also you've, you've kept a promise to yourself. It, it is a, a 20 week long, 24 week long promise to yourself that you've kept now. And no one can take that away from you. No matter what the placing is, you stuck to your word for the upteenth days, however many days that is, 
you stuck to your word and did everything that you possibly could. And so going into the prep with that understanding is very helpful. I, I find that it is huge for, for athletes to understand that that's going to come. And it's so nice to have that conversation with them after they get off stage for prejudging and say, did you feel it? And every single one of them, yes. And then the, I've also had situations this year where athletes have been like, I've let myself down. And that's, I mean, the fact that you're able to come to that realization is very, uh, very good. But at the same time, like y- you knew that was coming. So uh, I think that's one hard thing for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. I, that definitely hits home for me. Um, both of them do, but that one especially. Because, um, and that kind of takes me back to my first time on stage and definitely my last time on stage. I knew there's two people that can walk off stage, as you mentioned, right? The person that walks off, smile on their face, regardless of the the placing, regardless of what happened. And they know I did everything in my power to to do the absolute best that I could have done right here, right now at this one moment. And then there's the opposite end of that where you walk off and you immediately know, or it's probably more less going to happen to you while you're on stage. And you know, almost instantaneously in that moment when you're sitting there holding a pose or, you know, off to the side where, you know, this is running through your mind of like, I know I didn't do everything I could have. I I took too many plays off. Um, and that kind of gets me into mine, which is kind of just like combining, combining things here from the both of you is this is competing was the first for me was the first real individual sport I ever tried. I, I mainly only, I only played team sports growing up. Right. So, you know, I, you could get, a, you can get away with taking some plays off in a team sport, right? If you're playing football, they didn't run it to your side. All right. I, I could take, you could take a play off. All right. If you're, you know, if you're playing basketball, you're, you're in a certain type of defense or offense, you can take a play off or two. And, you know, you may, you're probably going to still win that game potentially. Right not the case necessarily with this this individual sport and this was the first time that i was really you know hit square in the face with that reality of i can't take any plays off like if i take a play off that only reflects the that end goal it only reflects what's going to happen at the end of this and who you are when no one's watching is who is being displayed when all eyes are on you at the end right so day in and day out who are you when no one's watching? Right. And that's something that's been nailed in my head by my grandfather since I can remember is I don't care who you are when everyone's, you know, who you are when everyone's watching is a version is, is a version of you. It's one part of you. The bigger part that I'm concerned about is who have you been when no one's been watching? Like, who are you when no one's watching? And that I remember like on those hard training sessions on, you know, whether it's a one rep max or the hard training sessions that were just really tough to get through, um, or the cardio sessions that I ne- didn't necessarily want to do or the, the, whatever I'm, I'm home by myself. And, you know, I'm the only one that's going to know that I just gorged on all of this food. And then, you know, a week later comes check in and I'm like, I don't know what's happening. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, I, my weight, it must, be water, much. Weight. It must be water. Yeah. I, I don't know what's going on. Right. And only I know that happened, right? And I can promise you that those moments are going to eat away at you, right? Those moments are much harder to deal with than you just doing what you you promised yourself you would do, right? So keep the promises you make yourself and understand who you are when no one's watching it is who's going to be displayed when all eyes are on you at the end. Um, So I can promise you you're going to want to put effort into that throughout the process. And I will say, I know I'm bad about this, but one last thing, just because we are talking about first time competitors that I didn't really take into consideration until you guys were all talking, but you might give your absolute all and it might still not be good enough. And that's something that not enough of people talk about. And you have to be secure with the fact that you're making a decision to be subjectively judged and you have to be okay with how you feel about yourself. That doesn't mean that you can't be sad after a show. It doesn't mean you can't be upset. It doesn't mean that it can't hit you hard. But you have to be able to take that in stride of your best 
might not be good enough, so to speak, at that show, but you have to be able to keep picking yourself up and keep going. And that's something that I gave so much to so many of my preps and it wasn't good enough. I didn't win. I didn't get first place. I didn't do what I set out to do. And that does not detract from my self-worth or what I showed up to do. And that's something that that's when we talk about that mental aspect, that it really matters that you're able to go into this and be able to take these things and learn so much about yourself and take that as a learning experience instead of letting your worth just crumble to the ground um, when you don't get the placing you want, you don't get the call out or you don't show up how you want to show up. One thing that was told to me, uh, I just quickly say was um, your only it really resonated was the only thing you're entitled to is the work itself. The only thing you're entitled to is the pro- going through the process is the is the opportunity to do the work. You're entitled to that. And that's it. Right. You're not entitled to anything else along the uh, what comes after that. You're not entitled to that. Right. That's not up to you, especially in this sport. Right. It's very subjective. It's very how did you show up that day. Right. And you could do everything right. No stones left unturned. But also there's hundreds of other people that have potentially done that, too, that may be either ahead of you or just better than you at this point. And that is what it is. That's the sport. That's why that's, that's a part of the competition, right? That's a part of what makes this so tough, but also so rewarding. Um, so you're only entitled to the process. You're only entitled to the work itself. And that, that was a really good point to make Sue. Yeah. I I love that saying as well. Um, Well, thank you guys for tuning along. I know that this was a longer episode, but I think that there were a lot of great takeaways, a lot of great um, comments and advice as far as being a first time competitor. So definitely check out the post below, check out um, the um, place that you can submit questions, submit other questions, because we are going to do multi parts on this. Um, And then we also will have our inquiry link because we do have uh, multiple coaches on staff that are taking contest prep clients. And this is something where if you are a first time competitor, and you're looking at competing in 2022, I would highly recommend already getting in touch with a coach to figure out what that looks like. So that inquiry link will be below and we'll see you on the next podcast. Thank you guys so much. See you guys.